I think Jesus would just want us to share a few things, brothers and sisters, rather than the message that uh, I've prepared. And I think it might be good just to see what we've been dealing with on these Sundays and to stand back from it a little. Maybe you'd look at the uh, verse in 1 John and that would point it up. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. It's page 1065 in the Black RSV, 1065. And it's 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now really, what we talk about these Sunday mornings tends to be more for Christians. And uh, I have to kind of apologize, uh, really, to those who aren't Christians uh, for the Sunday morning uh, sermons because Romans has brought us to that point where God is dealing with the problems in Christians' lives. And so many of us as Christians have entered into part of that, you see. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. And many of us have entered into that. We really do know that our sins are forgiven and we do know that we're children of God. And we do know that we're going to go to heaven and we have the peace that the brother and sister were, t- were singing about. But the second part of the promise has not been made complete in us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there are many of us who know we're children of God and we know we're going to go to heaven and we know God has forgiven us, but we are not cleansed from all unrighteousness inside. Now, that is the state of a carnal Christian. And the typical scripture we use to express that state is the good that I would I cannot do and the evil I want to avoid, that's the very thing I do. And one of the real problems with many of us is we have been brought up in environments that have encouraged us to believe that that is the fight of faith that you have to put up with forever until you see Jesus face to face. Now, the truth is in fact utterly different from that. The Bible repeatedly says that God can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, Acts 15 and 9 talks about it in a different way if you look at it. Acts 15 and verse 9. Paul is talking about the Gentiles and why we should accept them into the Christian body without first requiring them to become Jews. And he looks back, you see, to what God has done with the Gentiles and refers, incidentally, to what God has done with them. And verse 8 begins the sentence, uh, Acts 15 and verse 8, page 962. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. And repeatedly, brothers and sisters, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, you find that God emphasizes, I can not only forgive the things you're doing against me, I can actually cleanse you from the thing inside you that makes you want to get angry, that makes you want to be lustful, that makes you want to be irritable. I can cleanse you from that. And what we have been really sharing, dear ones, is that you're cleansed from that through being filled with the Holy Spirit in response to your readiness to die to self with Jesus. And that's really what we've been saying. And that the problem with many of us who are living defeated Christian lives is that we have always thought of Jesus as dying for us, but not us dying with Jesus. And so that piece, you remember, in 2 Corinthians was absolutely new to us. That we judge that if Christ died for all, then all died. And we have never thought for a moment that we died or that we had any need to die. And so for many of us, it's just a new revelation. The whole idea of dying to self with Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can fill you with himself. And brothers and sisters, a lot of you, even after listening Sunday after Sunday, still will ask me, well, Pastor, how do you come into this? And loved ones, I can only share with you that it is a matter 
of real submission to the Holy Spirit and real believing. And that's what it is. It's trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. You trust what God says he has done in Jesus, that is that he has crucified your old self with Jesus, and you obey the Holy Spirit completely in your own life. And if some of you say, oh, brother, I've tried that, I've tried that. What's the problem? I still have this anger rising up inside me. Then, dear ones, you have been unable to believe that you were crucified with Christ because there's a bit of you that doesn't want to be crucified. And so that's the problem with many of us, you see. We keep on believing, believing, with believing. We say, yes, I was crucified with Christ, I was crucified with Christ. But it's auto-suggestion we're involved in. It's not real honesty with the Holy Spirit. And so for many of us, a first step to being able to believe that we were crucified with Christ is simply to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, where am I not willing to be crucified with Christ? Where am I not willing to die to self? Where am I not willing for you to do whatever you want with me? And so for many of us, we need to come to the ground of our heart before we can really believe that we were crucified with Christ. After we come to that ground of our heart, dear ones, which some of us, we would all call it by different names, you see. Don't get all uh, involved with whether Campus Crusade agrees or whether Navigators agree or whether the Baptists agree or the Presbyterians agree or the Methodists agree. That's not the issue. In Baptist circles, we would probably call it full consecration. But it's a place where you absolutely surrender everything and are willing for Jesus to do what he wants with you, and are willing to be crucified with Christ absolutely, and not to live for yourself at all. And then the Holy Spirit baptizes you with himself, fills you with himself, and brings in ab about in you a love of people that you've never had before. So, dear ones, those are the two steps, you see. Real believing that you have been crucified with Christ, and in order to do that, many of us have to come to the point where we're willing to believe that. Because many of us will believe it up here, you know, and we'll be lusting away down here, but we'll be saying, oh, I'm crucified with Christ, I'm crucified with Christ. But still, there's a whole area of our sex lives that we haven't submitted to Jesus. So that's where many of us come into trouble, you see. We try to believe over the top of a whole lot of unconfessed sin and a whole lot of unsurrendered areas of our lives. On the other hand, some of us really do believe, and then when it comes to the business of obeying the Holy Spirit, we just won't. Someone, I think, uh, was asked, uh, how do you stay in victory? And this woman said, instant obedience. Instant obedience. The Holy Spirit tells me to do something, I do it immediately. I don't negotiate or discuss. Now, the ones, maybe it's good, you know, that God gave us just a shorter time this morning so that I could bring the real guts of the thing home to you again. That the way to enter into victory is belief and submission, or trusting and obeying. And the trusting, of course, with many of us is impossible because we believe up here that we're crucified with Christ, but we haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to show us where down here we're not willing to be crucified with Christ. Eleven ones, I want to stop so that you can question, you know. Now, are there any questions? I know it's shorter, but sometimes it's good. God knows the way we should uh, deal with each other Sunday by Sunday. All right. Brother says, does it mean cleansed from all unrighteousness, whether it's realized or not? It seems, brother, that righteousness in the Bible is essentially a conscious thing, you know. Now, in other words, God holds us responsible for the sins that we know we're committing. There may be a mass that we're committing that we don't know about, but his blood covers that. And that is maybe the unconscious sin that is talked about in Leviticus. But the sin that brings guilt to our hearts and an inability of the Holy Spirit to fill us is conscious sin. And it would seem to me, brother, that the Holy Spirit cleanses us from all conscious unrighteousness. On the other hand, obviously the Holy Spirit fills a lot of other areas in our lives. So who can... We cannot say, I'm sure you can't say, he doesn't cleanse you from the unconscious sin. But it would seem to be it's the conscious sin that causes us the problem. Yeah. And he cleanses us from that. Then it seems to me, as our, we live on under the Holy Spirit, he brings us more light. And he may say, you know, we may never have realized that we talk too much. 
We may never have realized that we were talking about other people. But the Holy Spirit shows us, certainly. You talk about other. Many of us have attitudes to our mums and dads that we don't realize. They're so unconscious. When the Holy Spirit brings them to light, then we need to submit on those areas too. And dear ones, if you say, you know, uh, brother, is this a crisis experience or is it a gentle, gradual experience? For many of us, it has been a crisis experience. For some of us, it seems to come so naturally that we don't think of a crisis. But the heart of it is, dear ones, when the Holy Spirit asks you, are you willing to do anything? If you're immediately willing, then you know that you're in the right position with Jesus. So it's like conversion itself. It's not a matter of looking back to some great experience that you had. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. The proof of what you've experienced in the past is your present attitude to God's will. Now there would be other advantages and other benefits of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Many of us have found out just a new life of prayer. You know, absolutely new vitality in our prayer lives. All of us, I think, have found our witnessing lives being just effortless. We have found all parts of our lives coming into line with Scripture in it seems almost an effortless way to us after we've come into being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's good to keep clear of denominational questions because they're not always the most edifying, but any denominational questions. Loved ones, it seems to me if we look into all our denominations, at the bottom of all our denominations' hearts is the yearning for this life of full surrender. And they really all teach it in one way or another. Are you speaking of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes, yes. Sister says, am I speaking of being filled with the Holy Spirit in the same sense as baptism with the Holy Spirit? Yes, yes, it seems to me if you look at the New Testament, baptism with the Holy Spirit is both an inward and an outward work. It is an inward cleansing from inward sin, from anger and jealousy and envy by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is an outward anointing with the Holy Spirit and the nine gifts of the Spirit for power and witnessing and ministry. And that it is all one experience. And maybe if we were... If we were more like the New Testament people, we, maybe we'd find that conversion and being filled with the Holy Spirit was more one experience than we really believe. And I think with many it was, and with many it could be. It seems maybe there's no reason why if we lived as, a, as an obedient group of people here, our children might not come into everything that God has for them, and not have to come into it in two stages like many of us. But it says, yeah, I, I, w- I would feel that the New Testament teaches a complete work, a baptism with the Holy Spirit that is an inward filling and an outward anointing. Yes. And I know that the dear Pentecostal brothers and sisters have tended to emphasize the outward anointing with the ministry of the gifts. I, I would just suggest that we all go astray when we put more emphasis on the victory or on the ministry than on the Holy Spirit. It seems to me it's not the gifts or the fruit that is vital, but it's the Holy Spirit himself. Are we in a completely submissive relationship to him, brother? How do you discern guidance from the Holy Spirit from your own personal motives? Brother, it seems to me that I had most problems with guidance in my own life when I was, it was like having a radio that was tuned in to several stations at once so that only one of them was coming through, and it was coming through kind of faintly. I found that before I really settled things with Jesus about living for his glory alone, when I was seeking guidance about a job, I was half alive to my own wishes for finances. I was half alive to my own wishes for success, uh, for fame, uh, for all those other things. And it seemed to me when I died to those and tuned out from those other things, then the voice of the Holy Spirit began to come through strong and clear. I think that's part of the answer. I'm sure it's not all of it. But I think that's part of it. And I think another part of it is coming into a place of real neutrality about what God wants you to do. Lord, I'm willing to go there or go here. I'm really willing. And allow the Holy Spirit to search you to show you if you're in a real place of neutrality. Then when you are, the Holy Spirit comes gently through. 
It seems rather that God said, I will guide you with my eye. And you see, if you have a dad and a little son and he's guiding with his eye, well, I can do it with my little dog. He knows fine well what to do and what not to do by the way I'm looking at him. Now, I'm afraid most of us are looking everywhere else but at God. And so we are not able to be guided by his eye. We want him to guide us with a loudspeaker, and he won't. He, he says, no, if your eyes are upon me, I will guide you. If they're not, the guidance is worthless anyway. That's good. One of, the, one of uh, the greatest difficulties is to see a brother or sister that is terribly critical of everybody else, and yet they come week after week and say, oh, I'm trying to pray to get the Holy Spirit to show me what's wrong with me, but I can't see it. And, you know, it's coming out in their own lives moment by moment. And it seems to me the Holy Spirit will allow symptoms to express themselves inside us. Many husbands and wives here who have tried to come into an awareness of the Holy Spirit have found that they've become harder to live with because the Holy Spirit has allowed them to come into situations where their self expressed itself more than ever it had before at home and until it became, it became obvious to them. Yeah, I can see what part of self I have not died to. Yeah, yeah. And then once that was, uh, praise God, you know, that we can... Converse. I know we can only converse so long. It's only as the Holy Spirit enables us to, so many of us to converse and be interested. But we really need to thank him for, for being gracious to us this morning. I'd like to try to preach this Sunday sermon next Sunday. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the way you're bringing us into a real family relationship with each other. Where we really are at ease with each other and are willing to go with each other in things. Lord, we thank you. So different from Watergate and so different from distrust that seems to rule our society. And we do thank you for bringing us into a body and a relationship with other brothers and sisters where we can really converse and discuss and share together. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are able to bring absolute victory into all our lives. And we would trust you, Holy Spirit, to show each one of us this week new places where we are to find our place on the cross with Jesus. New areas of our lives that we are to walk into obedience. Lord Jesus, we trust you for that. Trust you for a good day today and a day when we live above